Tick tock. Time to rock. <laughs> Superfluous pastry said David's warming up shadow boxing. That is how I warm up. That's funny. I don't know anyone knew that. <laughs> hey, I hear your raggedy dog back there. <laughs> the big one was down here earlier. That's actually, they're upstairs. Oh, yeah? Yeah. All right, well, we are here to talk about the deity of Christ. Um, lots of other topics to it. You know, you know what I was reading right here, right as we we're sitting here ready to go live? What? I was reading more black babies in New York City are killed in abortions than are born alive. Mm. This came up months ago. I don't know how I didn't see it. Hmm. Disturbing abortion statistics. More black babies are aborted in New York City than are born alive. Anyway, got more. Uh, gonna have to make more videos so, on uh, on abortion here. Sounds somewhat like they're perpetuating the history of Islam. Only uh, <clears throat> Islam, with its 140 million black Africans. Uh, most of whom died before they ever made it to Muslim lands. Mm -hmm. um, the other day I was talking to an African-American Muslim who seems to think that uh, the Europeans had, uh, you know, had a corner on the market, not realizing that the Arab slave trade easily trumps, in terms of numbers and uh, deaths, uh, <clears throat> anything done by Europeans. And they would, uh, the, the Muslim slave traders... Gosh, I, I got to make videos on this this month, man. It's Black History Month. This would be the perfect time mm. to talk about the uh, the uh, um, the Saharan uh, slave trade. Uh, but they would they would castrate their black slaves uh, because it was uh, you you didn't need them to have babies. It was very easy to get more slaves. Um, they're, they're coming. It was an endless supply, so you could castrate them. That way, you make sure they're not uh, they're not uh, messing around with your your wife when you're away on business. And so, uh, yeah, they would they would castrate they would castrate their black slaves. And uh, here, mm. in the land of the free, more black babies are aborted in New York City than are born alive. Anyway, got distracted by horrifying statistics before our show. Um, I think I'll have to have uh, Karen Cross for from National Rights of Life back on to discuss some of these statistics because there is a lot going on. I know we're here to talk about the deity of Christ, but uh, human beings are created in the image of God, so this is disturbing stuff that's going on with uh, you know full term abortions and things like that. Anyway, Anthony, we are here to talk about the deity of Christ, and this is a topic that we will want to be addressing regularly for a long, long time. Why would this be such an important point for Christians and for Muslims? Yeah, well, in the first place, um, you know, we're, we're concerned to know who God is, not simply that God is. God in the Bible makes it clear that it's not sufficient simply to believe that there is a God. Uh, we must believe in the true God. Jesus himself in John 17, 3 said, this is eternal life that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life is bound up in the knowledge of, of the true God. But in addition to that, uh, if Christ is not God, you know, just the other day, uh, one of the, the jobs I do, as you know, is I, I field theological questions for a particular ministry. And one of the questions I got from somebody, and it's not the first time, uh, but it's a, it's a really good question. But the person asked if the penalty, if divine wrath uh, poured out on sinners is such that sinners have to bear that wrath for eternity. How could Jesus endure uh, and pay the penalty for sin in just the space of a few hours on the cross? And as Christians, we would answer that precisely because Christ is not a finite person, right? He has a real human nature, but it was a divine person who, uh, through that human nature, experienced the full brunt uh, or weight of the divine wrath and therefore could appease the wrath of God for us in a finite amount of time. And so, uh, number one, uh, knowledge of the true God, and number two, our very salvation hinges on the fact that it was 
God incarnate who paid the penalty for our sin. And, of course, uh, we would be idolaters, as Muslims uh, accuse us, if Christ is not God, since Scripture teaches us to worship Christ, to pray in Christ's name and through Christ, uh, you know, sing hymns and praise to Christ, which we find throughout the New Testament. And so there are a lot of uh, really important reasons for uh, believing in the deity of Christ. And in fact, Jesus himself said in John 8, a passage we might look at more fully, uh, in John 8, 24, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Now, a lot of translations try to uh, fill in what they think is a an ellipsis in the Greek, uh, uh, but really uh, it isn't. But they'll say things like, unless you believe that I am he, or unless you believe that I am the one I claim to be, which allows some people to uh, try and plug in there things like, unless you believe I'm the Messiah, or something along those lines, which which is certainly true. We have to believe he's the Messiah. <clears throat> but Jesus is, is making the claim that he, as the Messiah, is, in fact, uh, the divine Lord who revealed himself to the prophets, to Moses and, and others. And he says that unless we believe that, then we'll die in our sins. Mm -hmm. And so, so uh, this is a pretty central issue in Christianity. When you, uh, when you look at the book of Acts and you see what the apostles went out and taught. Right? They'd been around Jesus for several years, and so they got to hear him talk about a lot of issues. But after his death and resurrection, when they went around preaching, they always focused on his death for sins, his resurrection, and his identity as Lord. So it was his death, his resurrection, and his deity. So this has been foundational to Christianity from the beginning. And uh, we've also, uh, we're also taught in Scripture that false prophets, false teachers are going to come. They're going to try and corrupt the gospel. And six centuries later, we get Muhammad. Muhammad comes along and he says, all of you here know, Muhammad comes along and says, hey, you Christians, you believe in God? Me too. You believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? Me too. You believe that Jesus performed miracles, so do I. You believe that he's the Messiah? Me too. I agree with you on pretty much everything, except he didn't die on the cross for sins, he didn't rise from the dead, and he's not Lord. Now, if we can get past those three things, we're good to go. And here we are, 14 centuries later, and it's an obsession with Muslims to attack the deity of Christ, which is, uh, which is actually good for us, because it allows us to focus on um, one of the core doctrines of Christianity. In other words, no matter what the topic is, and you see, how many times have you seen this, Anthony? No matter what the topic is, Muslims are going to bring the deity of Christ into it. You can say, hey, how do you reconcile, you Muslims, how do you reconcile your belief that Muhammad is a prophet with him having sex with a nine-year-old girl? Well, how can you believe God came out of a woman? Right, that, 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 would, be, that would be the question. Right? And so it doesn't matter what the topic is, you can say, hey, um, you guys claim that the Quran has been perfectly preserved, and yet we look at your sources and we see entire chapters came up missing, large passages came up missing, verses were eaten by a goat. Those verses, we know what the verses said. They're not in the Quran today. Why? Because the only copy was eaten by a by a, a goat. What's going on? What, how do you believe that? Well, how do you believe that God came out of a woman? How can you believe that God ate food? How, how can you believe this, right? It doesn't matter what the topic is. Muslims bring it back to the deity of Christ. And on the one hand, that's a, that's a sad situation, a sad situation, but on the positive side, it's every, every time any topic is raised, Muslims are basically opening the door to talk about Christian theology. So Christians, um, Christians should be sh studying their theology and getting some arguments down because Muslims are going to give you every opportunity to, uh, to talk about what you believe. And, and the reason I'm pointing this out is, um, you could get into a conversation with atheists. And the atheists might might you know be worried about terrorism and things like that, so they might be interested in religious topics like that. But it's more along the lines of, there lots of atheists are only interested in religion insofar as just to show that religion is bad or something like that or harmful. Um, and so, if you wanted to talk about the deity of Christ, there, to be to be clear, this, this is not all atheists, but lots of atheists are going to be like, I don't care. I don't care if you want to talk about the deity of Christ. I don't care what Jesus said. I, I just don't care. Right? Whereas Muslims do. They're, they're supposed to. And uh, they're put in a, a bit of an awkward position when we actually examine the teachings of Jesus. Um, because Anthony, it, it seems to me, 
it seems to me Muslims are stuck and they don't realize they're stuck, right? Because there, there are only a couple of options here. If we take, if we, we can either, one, we can either take the words of Jesus in scripture seriously, or we can take it, or we can not take it seriously. If Muslims say we shouldn't take it seriously, then they've got a problem because their, their book, their Quran affirms the inspiration and preservation and authority of our books, right? So, so if they say, oh, don't take that seriously, they're, they're stuck with the Quran being wrong. So we have to take it seriously or Islam is false. But if we do take the words of Jesus, as we find in the Gospels, seriously, then, well, if you go with the obvious, obvious, most clear interpretations and understandings of certain things Jesus said, you can only walk away concluding that this guy's claiming to be God. So that would mean that Islam is false. The only way Muslims can get around that is to say, oh, well, you know, what he really meant was, what he really meant when he claimed to be the final judge, what he really meant when he claimed to be the one who raises the dead at the resurrection, what he really meant when he gave himself all these titles of God, what he really meant, right? And there, that doesn't seem to be good enough either, right? Because in their constant state of reinterpretism, right, which is what they do with the words of Jesus, what Jesus really meant ism is... If, if that's the case, how can you take him seriously as a prophet, right? If this guy were truly a, were truly a Muslim prophet trying to convince people just to believe in the one God, he shouldn't be saying things that are even within a thousand miles of interpreting that, that he's God or that people should worship him. And yet people are worshiping this guy left and right in the scriptures, and he never says a word about it. So it, it doesn't seem like there's any good approach or way out of this for Muslims. What do you think, Anthony? If you let me put it this way, Anthony, if you were a Muslim, which direction would you go? Would you deny the scriptures, or would you try and reinterpret the words of Jesus? What would you do here? Yeah, you know, that's difficult because I think that Muslims basically do a, a combination of both of those, right? I mean, when when they want to, they'll affirm the scriptures. When they realize they're uh, caught in a in a problem, right? The text is too difficult for them to get out of. Then they'll deny the scriptures. Some Muslims are more skillful than others. Some some do uh, better work in reading the writings of heretics who have spent their uh, their lives trying to reinterpret things. Right. So uh, you'll find some Muslims, for example, who will uh, appeal to a passage uh, and say, you know, this this verse doesn't teach the deity of Christ because they think they have an answer to that. They realize what uh, other people have said regarding that passage. But then there are others who aren't familiar with what, uh, you know, looks plausible to some. And so they'll just outright deny the passage. Right. So I, I think you have to do a combination of both of those if you're going to be effective. And, and the better you do that. Right. The harder it is going to be for somebody to get, uh, you know, their hands on you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, like, for example, I mean, take take a text like John one. Right. John 1 1 says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. A uh, Muslim who uh, just hears that for the first time or who hasn't spent any time trying to figure out an answer to that will probably just say John's gospel was corrupted. John wasn't the author of the gospel. Who's John? When was that written? That was written too late. It can't be trusted. It's not reliable. You know, they'll, they'll say something along those lines. Other Muslims will say things like, well, that just means God's plan, right? The word God's plan was in the mm. beginning, right? And then if, it's not that we don't have an answer to that. The point is just that when they think they have a legitimate interpretation, or at least one that will fly for the sake of that conversation, I think that's what they'll go with, mm -hmm. right? And then we'll quickly point out to them that there are masculine pronouns used there, right? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God. He was in the beginning with God, and so on throughout the passage. Mm -hmm. So it's not referring to an impersonal plan. Mm -hmm. But but again, the point is simply that I think if, if they don't have anything to say, then it, it will be corruption, if they do think they have something to say, they'll say, I agree with this. You Christians don't, right? Mm -hmm. Paul, Paul distorted Christianity. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. we, 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 should, we should put together a kind of trilemma on this. You know what I mean? Like, mm. you, either, you, you guys either have, you, you got three options here. You either have to deny the scriptures, or you have to agree with Jesus that he's God, or you have to argue that he's the worst communicator in all of history. So which one is it? Which one is it, Muslims? You're, you're, you're denying, you're, you, you have to... Deny the script, deny our scriptures, in which case Islam is false because Islam affirms our scriptures, or you have to affirm the deity of Christ, in which case Islam is false because Islam denies the deity of Christ, or you have to claim that Jesus is the worst communicator in history. That's the only, uh, avenue open to you. But you, you could say that since they want to, since they want to argue that Allah is, 
is the worst communicator in all of history. They can't say that Jesus is the worst communicator in all of history. Um, so they're in trouble no matter where they go. Right. You, you know, another thing in light of what I was just saying, uh, it's interesting to me uh, just how clearly the arbitrariness of Muslims is on display when they try and argue against the deity of Christ in Scripture. Notice that when it comes to a gospel like John's, they'll say, uh, they'll, they'll either try to reinterpret it, right, because uh, John doesn't have the stigma that Paul does. You'll see why I'm bringing that up in a second. They'll either try to reinterpret it or they'll just say it's not the authentic gospel or something like that, mm-hmm. uh, or it's been corrupted, right? But why don't Muslims say similar things when it comes to Paul, right? Do you hear Paul? You hear Muslims saying, oh, those have been corrupted, right? Paul's writings, no, no, they, they want Paul's writings to be intact because uh, you know, they're going to dismiss Paul. Paul's mm-hmm. the one who innovated these things. Paul's the one who created these things. But there's no statement in Paul that is more uh, clear, more emphatic on the deity of Christ than you can find in, in other writings in the New mm-hmm. Testament, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when Paul says in Romans 9, 5 that Christ is God over all, forever praised, right? That's not any stronger than John's statement, you know, that the word was God. Uh, when Paul says in Titus 2.13 that Christ is our great God and Savior, that's not any stronger than John 20.28, 20, where Thomas says, My Lord and my God. Or when Paul says, In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form, in Colossians 2.9, that's not any stronger than what you'd find in Hebrews 1.8 or 10 or, uh, you know, on and on that we could go. Uh, and so it's just interesting to me. It shows that there's clearly uh, something more than just, uh, you know, an, an interest in, in giving good argumentation because mm-hmm. they're not being consistent, right? Uh, without any evidence, they'll say John was corrupted, but Paul just gets a pass, right? <laughs> because Paul's going to be dismissed on other grounds. Mm-hmm. All right, well, uh, we're going to uh, take a few comments, and then we're going to let Anthony uh, give some examples of some kinds of claims uh, that show the... Deity of Christ, uh, Bams here says, hello, ex-Muslim here, left a couple of months ago. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear that you have left Islam. We don't know what your position is uh, yet. Uh, glad you're here, though, uh, as we discuss the Deity of Christ. Um, Misty Radical Love says, like and share this video, please. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for who uh, who posts that. Uh, regularly over in the comments section, um, liking and sharing the videos. That's uh, it, it's it's not just when you click on like. Everyone, just so you know, when when you click on like and when you share a video, that's not just your individual like and your individual sharing. Um, YouTube is reading all of that and saying, "Oh, this video just got shared by this person, and this video just got liked this by this person." And YouTube says, oh, "Okay." Well, a bunch of people are liking this video and a bunch of people are sharing this video. Therefore, um, this is probably an important video that lots of other people are going to like. And then, you know, when you're watching YouTube video and suggested videos pop up over on the side, um, that's basically YouTube saying, that's basically YouTube saying, okay, these other people who tend to like the same kinds of videos that this person liked, they liked the video and they shared it. Therefore, this other person who tends to like the same kinds of videos would probably want to watch this. Let me put this in the suggested video videos box. So uh, thanks to everyone for uh, for liking and sharing. We have <laughs> Poop Zombie here. It says here is $20 to give your plant some water. Also, thank you for all your videos. I have mixed feelings about the plant. Um... Uh, I had grown vegetables at certain points in my life outside. I never taken care of a plant inside except for um, a couple of cacti. So I had had uh, cactus here and there through my life and never taken care of an actual plant. Um, did not water it nearly enough. Water is not going to help this thing at this, mo- at this point. It's dead. It's just, uh, it, it's, it's dead back there. I tried watering it, uh, but it's already dead. Uh, but I got an idea for how much I should water it. So I'm going to have to replace that one with another plant. Um, yeah, but that, that one is, uh, that one is, is dead. Uh, but, but there's a part of me that kind of likes having a totally dead plant behind me. I think it's slightly aesthetically pleasing. Um, Emmanuel says, uh, thanks for coming with uh, a topic again. Thank David and Anthony for, I believe that this is what the gospel is all about. More videos, please. Thank you again. And yeah, that's why we wanted to, uh, 
We talk about Muhammad a lot because uh, it's easy and it's fun, and and at the same time, um, at the same time, uh, it's extremely important. Just because most Muslims and most non-Muslims don't know a lot about what's in the Muslim sources. Your average Muslim has been misled all his life. He has no clue what's in his sources. He has no clue about the things that his prophet did. And if we don't share those things, then people just aren't going to hear them. And that's why we want to focus a lot on the uh, the Muslim sources and what they have to say about Muhammad. But at the same time, we we... We, we always want to come back to uh, the core teachings of the gospel, and so that's what we're going to uh, be doing now. Uh, we have one more comment here, and then we'll... Um, I did want to see a comment from a, a Muslim up here because it will help introduce the topic. Uh, I skimmed past it and then lost it. Uh, but here we have uh, Abdullah saying, I also left Islam in September and accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. Uh, Anthony, why is Praise that? Lord. Why is that a wise decision to make? <laughs> well, uh, let me just read it. Make sure I heard it right. Okay, uh, right. Right. Uh, just uh, uh, leaving Muhammad, who's an evident false prophet, uh, isn't going to save anyone. Right. It's. Uh, I still think a person's better off if they leave Islam. You know, the, uh, Scripture. A lot of people don't know this. Uh, while Scripture certainly teaches that every sin deserves God's wrath. Scripture doesn't teach that every sin is equal or that the punishment that a person will endure in eternity is the same as what would be endured by somebody who's guilty of greater sins, right? Jesus in uh, various places spoke of certain sins as being greater or less than another. Uh, For example, he said to Pilate, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin, right? So there are some sins that are greater Jesus also told a parable where he spoke of certain people being punished with few lashes as compared to those that would be punished with more lashes. And, and there you, you see the, the difference in the, the, the degree of punishment. And so uh, in the first place, it's a good thing to leave Muhammad. You're, you're certainly uh, not going to perpetuate some of those uh, sins. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the fact is, I, I, you know, that it, uh, you've probably heard Hitchens or people, other atheists, say things like... Uh, you know, it takes religion for people to do certain terrible things. That That's not mm-hmm. true. Uh, but it is the case uh, that uh, there are some things that people would do uh, by becoming Muslims that they wouldn't have done if they hadn't become Muslims. Mm-hmm. I've known plenty of people. I remember back when I was when I first became interested in studying Islam after converting to Christianity. Uh, and other people have heard this before. I was converted at, uh, in 1993 uh, after uh, being incarcerated for running with gangs and so forth. And uh, there was a guy that I befriended in there, an African American gentleman, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. I mean, and I, but I couldn't believe it. One day, I just saw this guy acting in ways I had never seen him act before, and found out that he had become a Muslim, and his mindset had completely changed from the 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 nice gentleman that he was to running around acting like a thug. It was it was it was pretty incredible transition or transformation. Uh, so, but in any case, the, the, the basic point is, you know, uh, it, you know, leaving Muhammad and casting off those sins that he would otherwise encourage people uh, to do that they might not do otherwise, uh, that's a good thing. But a person will still, you know, have to answer before God uh, for their sin apart mm-hmm. from Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm always a little, I'm always a little confused. Um, on, uh, on the, basically the issues that you, you just brought up there, that, uh, that by believing in Islam, you can end up doing some things that you wouldn't have done, you wouldn't have done if you, if you weren't a Muslim. Um, I've always been, I've always found it interesting how, uh, Muslims will send me messages. David, you're studying Islam so much. We can see that you're going to become a Muslim soon. And I'm always thinking, guys, you know, I'm a psychopath. You know, I'm a clinically diagnosed psychopath. You know that. You know that I have a violent history and you know how I interpret your texts, right? You know how I interpret uh, Muhammad's claim that he has been sent to fight people until they confess that there's no God but Allah. You know how I interpret uh, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. You know how I interpret Muhammad's claim that he has been made victorious with terror. 
So you know exactly what kind of Muslim I would be, right? You know exactly what I would do as a Muslim, right? You would, you, you have to know that if I were to accept Muhammad as a prophet, um, I would uh, believe that he's commanding me and calling me to commit violence. And you should know by now that I'm the sort of person who, if I believed God was calling me to do that, I would go out and do it. Um, so I'm the, I'm the sort of person that you would think, and I've had athe- I have atheists tell me this all the time. David, I, be- I, I think what you believe is nonsense, but I'm really glad you're a Christian. But atheists tell me they're glad I'm a Christian. Why? Because some of them understand it. Some of them understand, wait a minute, this is a guy who is pretty messed up by nature, but he believes that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sins and that hum- other human beings are created in the image of God and that he's commanded to love everyone and do what's, do what's for the good of everyone. That's what this guy believes, and that's basically why this guy is not as violent as he used to be. So there are atheists who say, gosh, I, I do see why some people, why, why Christianity can be good for some people. Um, but I am, I am confused as to why Muslims think that I'm going to be some really, really nice Muslim or something like that if I were to convert. Um, guys, if I ever convert to Islam, duck, because I'm coming for you all. <laughs> all right, just so you know. Um, so, Anthony, I uh, have a comment here from Saeed, uh, who keeps posting comments along these lines. And so he's, uh, he's before you actually address the deity of Christ, uh, you might want to give a quick rundown uh, in response to this, because we, we know that we know the impact Islam has on, on people, namely that uh, it ri- put it this way: people who are confused about the deity of Christ are, are usually confused by their own religion. In other words, it's Islam that's confusing you about what we mean by certain claims. Um, and so, Saeed Prince Lelouch says, "God is His own Father and Son." And uh, we keep having comments like this over and over again. So you might want to you might want to give a brief rundown of the father and son language as it relates to Christian theology, so that when we are talking about the deity of Christ, people have an idea of what we're talking about. Yeah, right. So uh, in the first place, uh, the, the terms father and son, most importantly, uh, should be understood in, as the way, in the way they would be understood in a, a Jewish context. For, for a Jew, this language primarily indicates two things. It indicates a distinction between the two, but also a, uh, a common essence, right? Uh, a father and a son are ultimately considered equal in the final analysis, although while a child is growing, he would be under the authority of his father. Uh, but when you, when you take away those things that could only be true of humanity and can't be applied to God, uh, then what you're left with are those two basic concepts, right? A distinction in personhood and equality of essence. And that's all the scriptures are affirming when they say that, uh, when they speak of father and son. Now, uh, when Saeed here says that God is his own father and son, he's simply missing those two basic facts, that while the father and the son are uh, one in essence, they're not the same person, right? So that that allows Christians to uh, speak consistently with the uniform affirmation in scripture that there's only one God, because Father and Son are not different gods, they share the same essential nature and being, and affirm the true distinction between the Father and the Son, because they're not the same person. Jesus is not the Father, Jesus is the Son. That's why the scriptures speak of the Father sending the Son, John 6, John 10, John 17. That's why the scriptures speak of uh, Jesus returning to the Father, John 13, John 17 again, numerous passages. That's why at the baptism of Christ you have the Father speaking from heaven, uh, the Son being baptized, the Spirit descending like a dove. Christians do not believe that Jesus is the Father. Jesus himself emphatically distinguished himself from the Father in numerous occasions, but uh, to speak of John 8 again, remember Jesus said, it's written in your law, the testimony of two is true, I am one, Uh, who bears witness, my father is another. So Jesus makes it clear that he is one person, he has a separate witness, and the father is another person who has uh, an additional witness to his own. Uh, And, uh, you know, that's why Jesus says in Matthew 28 to baptize into the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy Spirit. The, The Greek text is very clear there that there is a distinction between father, son, and spirit. And so Christians don't believe that Jesus is his own father. Christians don't believe that uh, the father is his own son. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So uh, I've started, uh, I posted a couple by Saeed. He keeps posting the same thing over and over again. Um, here's one from Nico. And uh, basically, we're trying to get a few misunderstandings and uh, here a, f- a flawed methodology um, out of the way in the be- in the beginning here, <laughs> in the beginning of the live stream. But he says, uh, Nico says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. Where is God, the Holy Spirit in the verse? Now, notice the assumption, <laughs> Anthony, that here's a passage. Here's the prologue to the Gospel of John, where John is talking about the identity and nature of Jesus. Uh, but. The Spirit is not mentioned in this verse. So you see, this is clear evidence against the doctrine of the Trinity, even though, obviously, uh, throughout the rest of the Gospel of John, especially if you get to uh, chapters 14, 15, and 16, there Jesus starts addressing the uh, the deity of the Holy Spirit. But uh, why don't you tell us what's what's wrong with the Islamic... Notice there's, there's always a flawed methodology. It's like there's... <laughs> I mean, Nico, do you really want to adopt this method where if I go to the Quran... And I point out some Islamic doctrine being taught in the Quran. I say, aha, but, but it doesn't talk about this other thing. It doesn't talk about this other doctrine over here. Yeah, and in fact, there's an easy example here. Uh, according to Muslims, the Quran is the verbatim speech of Allah, right? And Muhammad is simply reciting it. So we find repeatedly in the Quran, Muhammad is told to say something, and then the words that he's told to say follow. But we know that, according to Muslims, Muhammad did not receive this directly from Allah. He received it from Jibreel, right? So why don't we ask every time we look at a verse where it says say and say, where's Gabriel, right? Mm -hmm. Where's Jibreel here? Mm -hmm. Uh, Apparently, Allah is communicating this directly to Muhammad, right? No Muslim would accept that when it it came to that kind of thing, Mm -hmm. uh, which shows that they don't accept the the form of their own argumentation. Uh, So we could easily dismiss this. It's just fallacious as to its form. Uh, but it also just ignores the, the fundamentals of interpretation. You know, the, the context is what determines <clears throat> things. And in, in the context, it's the, the focus is on the fact that the word uh, is becoming flesh, right? Mm-hmm. The word has, is, is who created the world has now become flesh. He's entered into the world and is going to uh, bring about redemption. And so the spirit doesn't have to be mentioned at that point. But there's something even... Uh, more problematic with this reasoning. A- any Jewish person who heard John begin his gospel by saying, in the beginning, mm-hmm. their minds would immediately revert back to Genesis 1-1. They know exactly what John is doing. I mean, again, it's like an American hearing words like, uh, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, right? Mm-hmm. I don't have to do anything else. Every, every American's going to start thinking of the Declaration of Independence, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so th- those those things that are introduced in the Declaration of Independence, if they're familiar with it, uh, are, are going to be involved in their understanding of what I do point out, whether I bring up every particular or not. Well, when you go back to Genesis, which John is clearly alluding to, the Spirit is immediately mentioned, right? It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the deep. So the Spirit is presented as present with God at the beginning, and he's active at, at that time. He's brooding over the creation. The pr- picture there, and this is a, 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 a word picture that's used elsewhere in the Old Testament, uh, it's like a, a eagle hovering over its nest, right, uh, protecting its young. And so the idea there is of the Spirit being uh, providentially uh, superintending the creation. Uh, elsewhere it says... Uh, uh, you know, the spirit upholds all things. If God were to withdraw his spirit and his breath, all mankind would perish. So the spirit is the one, uh, together with the, the father, who upholds and preserves the creation. And so, again, uh, for John to, ver- to introduce his gospel with the opening words of Genesis would evoke in the Jewish mind Genesis 1, where the spirit is mentioned. John doesn't have to specifically mention the spirit there. Uh, you know, he, uh, if the spirit's not the person he's specifically going to be, the spirit didn't become incarnate, right? Uh, but, uh, but, but besides that, I mean, Jesus goes on throughout the gospel, as you said, to, to mention the spirit. He mentions the spirit in, in John 4. He mentions the spirit in John 7. I mean, over and over again, Jesus mentions the spirit. So, mm-hmm. but, but notice, notice again the inconsistency, right? Notice the person didn't say, uh, uh, it, he, he thinks he has an argument here that flies, so he's willing to let John uh, stand as it is. But if, if it did mention the Spirit, what we would say, he, what he would say is, "I want to see Jesus say it," right, or or something along those lines. 
right? Muslims don't realize how uh, incredibly arbitrary they are, right? What, what they th think is an argument in one case that uh, they won't use if if they don't think it will work in another case. Mm -hmm. um, one more here, because this will allow us to uh, set up methodology here. Undercover ISIS member. <laughs> <laughs> Undercover ISIS member says, uh, explain why Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Um, and I, the reason I bring this up as far as methodology is concerned is here is a verse that you could easily understand in a way that is uh, at odds with the deity of Christ unless you're reading it in the context of the rest of what Jesus said, right? Unless you're taking Jesus' words as a whole, and uh, then you might, uh, you might want to interpret this in a way that is consistent with all of the other things Jesus said. So, Anthony, what do you think about, uh, what do you think about this passage? Yeah, in the first place, uh, notice that the verse is affirming something, not denying something. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, uh, the man comes up to him, good teacher, what shall I do? To inherit eternal life, I'm reading Matthew or Mark 10, that, uh, mm -hmm. the account in Mark 10. Jesus said to him, "Why do you call me good?" So he's asking a question; he's not mm -hmm. making an assertion. Yeah, and, and and Anthony, by the way, that's really that's really uh, important to point out because pretty much every Muslim that I have ever heard bring up this verse when they say what it says. They say, "Oh, Jesus said." Jesus said. God is only good, and I'm not, or something like that, right? They'll misrepresent yeah. what it said. He said, hey, do, no, what, what don't, the, call yeah, me don't call me good. Only God is good. Don't call me good. Only God is good. For everyone, but before Anthony even goes into it, notice, does Jesus say, I'm not good? And notice, Jesus is the same, is the same person who called himself the good shepherd. Do, is Jesus denying that he is good here? Does he say, don't call me good? No, not what he says. Yes, a question. Guy comes up, good teacher, good teacher. Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Why are you calling me good? Only God is good. Don't you know that only God is truly good? Yeah, I know that. Okay, why are you calling me good? Go ahead, Anthony. Right, and notice, though, that if you if you take it that way, you're missing the entire point of the gospel, mm -hmm. right? From beginning to end, Jesus is being presented as the in the gospel, as the sinless substitute of humanity, the one who's come to bear the penalty for our sins, precisely because he alone is good and, and can take away our sin. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of, of introducing Jesus at the beginning of the gospel as the Lord's Christ, as the, as the Father's beloved Son, the one who's now uh, being anointed for the very purpose of executing the plan of redemption. Uh, Jesus himself in Mark 10, same chapter, by the way, uh, says uh, that uh, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many, which presupposes his basic goodness. If he's not good, he can't atone for the sins of others. Mm -hmm. And and again, you know, a lot of uh, this is sometimes misused, but uh, a lot of scholars will observe that the Gospels look like what, what they basically are, are passion narratives. That is mm -hmm. narratives that are uh, primarily concerned to tell us about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And then they say the rest of the Gospels that precede it are just like an extended in introduction, right? They're just, they're sort of introducing us uh, to who this person is who's about to bear the sins of the world. And so my point here is simply to observe that if you can read a question that Jesus asks in a way that goes against the entire thrust of the gospel, then you know that you've done some terrible uh, work at uh, exegeting the verse. Mm -hmm. But uh, not to get bogged down in, in this text, uh, notice that, uh, I mean, i just make a quick point here, and, and, and a lot of people really don't read, the, read the, the passage all the way through, which I think, uh, uh, in fact, I, I wonder how many people even know where the context of this discussion ends. Uh, but it, it starts off with the man saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So the assumption is, I'm going to inherit eternal life by doing good. And Jesus then questions him, why do you call me good? And then points out that only God is good. And then he says, you know the commandments, do not murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't defraud, honor your father and mother, and so forth. And the guy says, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Now, we, we know that uh, uh, from Scripture that, that this is... Uh, uh, this is the sort of thing a person who hasn't really uh, 
uh, felt the the weight of the commandments, right? He doesn't he hasn't really had a, a true uh, insight into God's holiness or into his own character. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, who reduces the commandments merely to externals, for example. Uh, you know, you could you could convince yourself that you're a good person if you're if you're thinking of murder as literally taking a life, right? Most people can say they haven't done that. Uh, you can convince yourself that you're not an adulterer if you reduce that command to uh, not literally taking your neighbor's wife or something like that. But once you realize that this is not just addressing externals, but also uh, your thoughts, right, your your feelings, uh, your wishes, what you would do if you could get away with it or th- something like that, uh, which is exactly what Jesus says in numerous places, the most clear, I think, is probably Matthew 5 through 7, right, where Jesus says things like, if you hate somebody in your heart, you're guilty of murder. Uh, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you're guilty of adultery, you know, th- those sorts of things. And that's that's ultimately which catches Paul short, right? Paul says that, you know, I, I thought I was pulling it off, basically, in Romans 7, until I got to that command that says you shall not covet. And, and why is that? Because covetousness addresses not simply your external actions, but uh, the thoughts mm-hmm. and intents of your heart, yeah. right? And so Paul, who thinks he's pulling things off beautifully, knows the hidden corruption of his own heart and the sorts of things that he loves and, and would do and desires. Uh, and so anyways, this man simply focusing on uh, the external requirements of the law says, oh, yeah, I've kept all that. And then Jesus then puts his finger on uh, the real issue. He says, well, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess, give it to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. So ultimately, the answer to how can I obtain eternal life is found in Jesus' statement, come follow me. But then, notice what the disciples say, and here's what I meant by saying people don't follow out the context. Uh, uh, Jesus, uh, looking around, said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Right? So so the disciples are getting the point here. Mm-hmm. They realize that what, the, the, what Jesus has just laid down is is not such as any person could, could possibly uh, pull off. And then it says, Jesus looking at them said, with people it's impossible, but with not with God, for all things are possible with God. And so uh, at the end of the day, Jesus shows that... Uh, uh, this man has a faulty uh, notion of goodness, a uh, faulty uh, ec- I- I thought of what he could possibly do. Uh, and at the bottom, at the end of the day, his only hope is uh, that God himself will affect for him the salvation that he, he couldn't uh, mm-hmm. accomplish himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a couple of things in that passage. Um, one, Jesus isn't clearly isn't denying his, his goodness in the passage, and he certainly isn't denying his deity there. Uh, you could interpret it that way if you just looked at that verse and you ignored everything else in the passage and everything else Jesus ever said, which unfortunately is how many uh, Muslims read this passage. Um, but uh, as you pointed out, notice this this guy's saying, hey, I've, ke- I've kept all that. I've kept all that. And then Jesus says, oh, but that's not enough. What's he saying? I've kept the law. I've kept the law. Jesus is saying, ah, not enough. Now come follow me. Come follow me. Now, so so notice, guys, if if you you Muslims, if you really think that you know righteousness is just keeping these keeping these laws and keeping these commands, uh, this guy was supposed to follow Jesus the moment Jesus shows up, and if he'd done that, if he'd done that instead of walking away sad. Um, right after, right after this, uh, and this will lead up to, to Anthony quoted um, ten forty five. But right after this, again, same chapter, verse 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, very interesting that Muslims would go to Mark chapter 10, but uh, saying, see, this is Jesus talking, says, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. So they're going to kill him. And the same passage that many Muslims bring up to try and defend Islam. Jesus says they're going to kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Um, the disciples 
obviously don't like the claim that Jesus is going to die. But, as Anthony quoted, as Jesus goes on to explain, verse 45, Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Why is Jesus' death different from other people's death? Well, his life is actually a ransom for other people. How is that possible? Well, because of who he is, right? Of, of who he is. And uh, so the, the guy who came up to him and had a question um, could have probed Jesus a little further on this issue, um, but instead he walked away. And we hope that Muslims won't walk away. Um, all right, Anthony. Why do? Why, a, apart from the context of, of, John, of, uh, of Mark chapter 10 here, um, why would we interpret Jesus' claims and his statements in Scripture uh, in light of, of a kind of Christian theological uh, assumption that he is divine, that he is Lord. Why Why would we do that? I know there are lots of different ways you can go here, um, lots of different approaches that can be taken, but uh, why? basically why do Christians believe that this man who's a man and who uh, goes up and who dies and who performs miracles, who rises from the dead, why do we believe that he is also God, is this something that we got from some church council, or is this based mm. on what Jesus said? Right. So, well, it, it, it's based, yeah, like you said, you can go a number of ways with this. Uh, I, I would say, first of all, it's already uh, taught in the Old Testament, right? It's already something that the Old Testament leads us to expect. Uh, you have explicit statements to this effect in, in various places. You have... For example, in Isaiah 7:14, and I'm going to say something here to uh, make clear why this is relevant uh, for a reason. You'll you'll understand why. But in Isaiah 7:14, it says the virgin shall conceive and give birth to a child, uh, and, and uh, this is the name by which he will be called Emmanuel, right? Which means God with us. Now, uh, many people think that this can be dismissed on the grounds that other people have theophoric names. A, a theophoric names, for those that don't know, uh, means that a, a name that has God's name in it. Right? There are many people in the Old Testament who have theophoric names. Perhaps the most famous in recent history is the name Elijah. Right? The, the divine name is found at the end. Uh, actually, you have... Uh, Doesn't you have Elijah mean God is with us? <laughs> no, that's what Emmanuel means. Um, now, now it's so Elijah is, and, and it's what's interesting. Sometimes Old Testament names, uh, you don't see this in the English, but sometimes the names are spelt somewhat differently and can bring out uh, a shade of different meaning. But, but the basic meaning of uh, Elijah, the way that it's used, means my God is Yahweh, right? The, the Hebrew word L, the, the first two letters in in uh, Elijah, and then the the E at the end. It's it's literally. Uh, Eliyahu, uh, but there's it, Eli means my God, and Yahu is a reference to the name Yahweh. It's a contracted form of the divine name. So the name of the prophet Elijah means my God is Yahweh or Yahweh is my God. Now, obviously, Elijah is not God, right? And there are other people in the Old Testament who have uh, names in them. Sometimes the divine name occurs at the beginning, uh, such as uh, Yonathan, Right, which means uh, Yahweh gives uh, or gift of Yahweh, uh, but their Yah is at the beginning. Sometimes it occurs at the end, as in the case of Eliyah, Eliyahu. Um, but uh, in uh, all of these cases, we would say these people bear names that point to God. Right, they point to some something that's true about God, or that's true of the person in relation to God. Uh, so, so the prophet, or, or so Jonathan would be. A gift of God, right? His parents would have considered him a gift from God. Uh, but in the case of Jesus, we say that the name Emmanuel goes beyond simply pointing to God and actually tells us something about Jesus, right? And and we do that for many reasons. Uh, the, Isaiah 7 is part of a section of the prophet Isaiah that scholars recognize as a, uh, a unit, right? They're, they have a common focus and, and that, that section is called the Scroll of Emmanuel, because the, the whole theme from chapter 7 through chapter 8 through chapter 9, 10, 11, and so forth, is the coming Messiah. 
And uh, so when 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 this pro, uh, when this child is called Emmanuel, uh, he's he's in the very next chapter. Uh, he's referred to again. The the land of Israel is for, referred to as his land, right? It's it speaks of the land of Emmanuel, the land that belongs to him. So Israel is called his land. But then in chapter nine, you have even more emphatically uh, that uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and this is the name by, by which he shall be called: Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so again, you have uh, a clear effort. I mean, this is not just uh, a title that he's being referred to. Now, this is a description of who he is. And so, uh, in fact, uh, it's easy to miss. But all of these really are divine titles, the way they're being used there. But one that's easy to miss is when he's called wonderful. If you look at the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for wonderful is always used exclusively for God or for divine miracles. So it's always uh, either a reference to God or something God does. Uh, and you might remember that in the Old Testament, one particular figure was asked, you know, what is your name? Remember in Judges 13, the angel of the Lord appears, uh, and, and he's, uh, they ask his name. It's Manoah. Manoah asks him his name, and he says, why do you ask my name? And then he goes on to say, it is wonderful. Right. And, and the word literally means something like beyond comprehension. That's the idea. Uh, something that goes beyond what, what uh, we can think or conceive. And so you can see why it would be also used of miracles. But, but so the point is that here you have this figure in the Old Testament who says that's his name. And when you look at the context, the angel of the Lord is not a, a, a created angel. The angel of the Lord is a divine person. Manoah and his wife go on to sacrifice to him, and he accepts their sacrifice and worship. Uh, the angel of the Lord is explicitly called God in numerous places. Uh, and again, just, just to clarify this a little bit, uh, the word angel, is it, it doesn't mean in the Old Testament the same thing it means for us. We always, well, it does, it has an overlapping meaning, but we always use the word angel to refer to one of the created heavenly hosts. Mm -hmm. But in Hebrew, the name just means messenger. It's used for human beings. It's used for the heavenly host, but it's also used for God when God comes and speaks. So uh, it, it's used, for example, the, 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 the prophet Malachi, right? The last book in the in our English uh, translations of the canon. Uh, the last book of the Old Testament is the, the book of the prophet Malachi. Well, that's the name of the word. Uh, that's where you get the word angel from. Uh, Malachi, just like Eli, right? Remember, my God. Malachi means my messenger. And so the prophet is called God's messenger, God's angel. And the re and, and part of the reason he's he's named that is because he gives a specific prophecy in Malachi three one. Remember about two messengers, right? Let me let me pull that up real quick. I want everybody to get this because this is actually a powerful text for the deity of Christ. But it, it brings together a couple of things I've been pointing out. In Malachi three one, it says, "Behold, this is God speaking. I am going to send my messenger, my Melach." my angel, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So here you have two messengers, one of whom is preparing the way for the other. Now, those who are familiar with the New Testament will recognize this is the passage that's cited uh, in Mark chapter 1, right? In Mark 1, this passage is cited, and it's uh, said to be fulfilled in John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. So the two messengers, the two angels mentioned in Malachi 3, are John the Baptist and Jesus. But notice what it says of that second messenger in, in Malachi. First of all, it says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, Mark tells us that's John, and he'll clear the way before me. God mm -hmm. speaking says that messenger who Mark says was John, is going to clear the way before me. We know from Mark's gospel that that's Jesus. And yet here in the, in the prophecy, God says it's, it refers to him. And then it goes on to say, speaking of him in the third person, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. So here he's called Lord, and the temple is referred to as his temple. Right. The, the temple, uh, you know, th there's no exception when you look throughout Scripture. 
the temple is always referred to as God's temple. It's not the temple of any human being. But so here it says that the one whose way is being prepared is going to come to his temple. And then he's referred to as the angel of the covenant and, and so forth. And so uh, already in the Old Testament, I'm just I really I'm just scratching the surface here. The, the expectation is that the Messiah would be God. The Messiah would be Lord. The Messiah would be the one who owns the land of Israel and uh, the temple. The temple is his temple. And so that's just that's just preparatory. And I, I might throw in here uh, one of the things that uh, Muslims like to do is, is they like to say, uh, you know, that's not how the Jews understand this. Right. And so they think they can just dismiss the testimony of the Old Testament because that's not what the Jews expected. Well, there's a lot of things uh, that we could say the Jews didn't expect they turned out to be wrong on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they didn't expect the uh, uh, the Messiah to be opposed to them, but Muslims have to uh, grant that he was, right? Because they believe that the Jews were opposed to him, whether they think he, they successfully crucified him or not. They do say that the Jews thought they tried to kill, thought they killed him, but but didn't succeed, right? Uh, but if they tried to kill him, whether they succeeded or not, it shows that they were opposed to him, which means that in some sense they have to grant that Jesus said things that were inconsistent with what they thought was the case, right? So at the very least, uh, uh, you know, appealing to the Jews isn't an automatic uh, trump card. You can't simply dismiss what the Old Testament says just because Jews don't believe it. But what's even more problematic here is that Muslims are usually aren't familiar with what Jews in the first century believed. Their their assumption is that the, the Jewish guy they bumped into down the street or the guy they watched on YouTube Tovia Singer. This, yeah, Tovia, Tovia Singer. They think that uh that uh these guys are uh the criteria of what Jews believed in the first century. But it's simply not the case. Jews in the first century did expect a divine Messiah. And I'll give you an obvious example. For, I could give you extra biblical examples of this. But uh, this one's easy to miss. But once you see it, it's kind of like, oh, you know, duh, how did I miss that? Uh, when the high priest is is uh, questioning Jesus, he, he says to Jesus, and, and note carefully what he says. Note the assumption of the question. Okay, A lot of people will read more into this, but uh, well, let me just quote it. But the high priest says, tell us whether you are the Christ, the son of the blessed one. And then Jesus says, I am. And you'll see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, notice that the high priest is not challenging the idea that the Messiah is God's son. The, the, the high priest is challenging the idea that Jesus is God's son. Mm -hmm. Their problem wasn't with this concept of a divine son or that the Messiah was God's son. Their problem was that Jesus, standing in front of them, was that son. And so you have it even in the New Testament where uh, at least certain Jews show evidence of believing in this concept. Because, again, I mean, if you if you pay attention to the verse, the, the high priest says, uh, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? That, that phrase is is explanatory of what he means by the Christ, right? Mm -hmm. he, he, he's saying that, uh, he's not saying, do you believe the Christ is the Son of the Blessed? Do you believe God has a Son? It's, are you the Christ who is the Son of the Blessed One? Okay, so the, the assumption of the question is that God has a Son. And why would they believe that? Well, because throughout the Old Testament, uh, it speaks of God's Son. Psalm 2 speaks of God's Son. Uh, Proverbs 30 speaks of God's Son. Numerous passages speak of God's Son and uh, and further identify him as the coming Messiah. Mm -hmm. So, All right, so that is a... Uh, uh summary of Anthony's point that uh, this isn't uh, this isn't something that originates in the first century. It's not simply that uh, everyone was dumbstruck by the claim that um, that there is uh, that, that God is somehow uh, multipersonal or something like that or that God could enter creation as someone. There were prophecies about this and the Old Testament as a whole uh, assumes it. And so when Jesus comes along uh, identifying himself as the divine son, 
the problem would be with whether he is right, right? It wouldn't be, oh, this is just incoherent. It, we, we don't know how God could enter creation or how uh, God could have a son. We don't know how. No, it's, it's is, he, is he right? And the people who rejected him were rejecting him because they believed he was wrong, that he was falsely claiming to be someone that the Old Testament prophesied was coming. Um, all right, so Anthony, uh, I'm guessing we're going to go into the New Testament here. I did want to address another objection real quick. Uh, just because the objections really, really, really help us reinforce how important it is to read the claims of Jesus uh, in light of the immediate context and in light of the the greater uh, context of the New Testament and of the entire and the entire revelation, the entire scripture. So we have here from Juad White, and I could go through this if you want. You can add some comments, but uh, uh, you, you could go on to the New Testament um, after this. Uh, but Juad White says, "My Father is greater than me." John's Gospel. Case closed. It was a very Islamic verse. So notice, everyone, case closed here. Case closed. There's no more case because Jesus said, my father is greater than me. And so you can do away with all this talk about the deity of Christ or the doctrine of the Trinity. Jesus said, my father is greater than me. He said it right there in John chapter 14. So how can you Christians go on claiming that Jesus is God. Now, let's take a little look here at John chapter 14, right? So, Jesus has been telling his followers that he's going to die, that he's leaving them, that he's going away, and they're all broken up and broken hearted, right? Because why? They, when, when they came to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they believed he's going to go up He's going to conquer the Romans, and he's going to establish Israel as the leaders of the world, right? The, the enemies of Israel are going to be crushed, and God is going to reign through his Messiah over the world. And then Jesus starts breaking it to him. Actually, I'm going up to die. I'm going to be a ransom for many and so on. And they are really, really broken up over this, right? John chapter 14. Jesus starts off, let not your hearts be troubled, right? Believe in God, believe also in me. Ah, oh, you got a distinction there. You got a distinction, God and Jesus. Well, keep reading. So we get down to verse six. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. He says, if I, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now notice, they ju he, Jesus just said they've seen the father. What's going on here? Um, but as a side note, if you look at verse six, I am the way and the truth and the life. Notice those are all three. Those are titles of Allah. Allah is, uh, the truth. He is the living. He is the way, right? You can claim to speak the truth as a Muslim. You can't claim to be the truth. In fact, in Islamic history, if you walked out and because there was a Sufi who did this, he walked out and said, I am the truth. They killed him. They mm -hmm. executed him. Right? They understood. You can't, you can't say that. You can't claim to be the truth. That is a title of Allah. Here you have Jesus claiming the very titles of Allah. Right? So, what's going on here? Now, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What does that mean? Does that mean Jesus is the Father? That wouldn't make sense in light of what Jesus says about the distinction between him and the Father. But maybe we need to keep reading. Verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And it is enough. I'm focusing on this this father part because uh, uh, Nico over in the comment section is complaining about Jesus being the father. And you see what's actually going on here. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you and you still do not know me? Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father, right? Now, there would be two ways, and this is why we talk about the importance of, content, of context, the significance of context. If Jesus says, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, you could interpret that in, in two different ways. Uh, you could interpret it, one, you could interpret it, if you didn't read anything else, you could say, oh, Jesus is claiming to be the Father. But if you read the rest of what he says, you understand he, he can't be claiming to be the Father. So how could you possibly interpret, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Well, if Jesus shares the same nature and attributes as the father, then if you've seen him, you've seen, you've seen the father as well, right? It's like if, uh, it's not that, I don't want to say it's like, but uh, to help you understand, uh, if I had a twin brother, right? And if I had an identical twin brother, 
and let's say his name was Bob, and you say, David, I'd like to see Bob. And I say, well, if you've seen me, you've seen Bob, right? Now, what's that mean? Well, we're, we're, we're identical. We're identical twins. So if you've seen me, you've, you've, you, you know exactly what, what Bob would look like. And so they're sitting here, show us the Father, show us the Father. And he's saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? If Jesus has the same nature and attributes as the Father, then if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Now, <clears throat> you get down. We go down a little farther. Verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, what? notice what he is claiming here, right? Jesus is saying that he's going away. He says, if I go away, you'll do even greater works than you've seen me doing, right? You've seen me going around performing miracles. You guys are going to, perform, you guys are going to be performing miracles, right? In fact, because now there's going to be a bunch of you going around performing miracles, you guys are going to perform greater miracles, right? He says, but because I'm going to the Father. Why are they going to be able to perform miracles? He says, because I'm going to the Father. So, because, so notice, they're upset that he's going away, but he's telling them, why are you upset that I'm going away? You should be glad that I'm going away. The things I've been doing, you're going to be able to do them now. And he says, whatever you ask in my name, this will I, this I will do. Now notice, Jesus is going away. He's going to the Father. And he's saying, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. So who's going to be doing what the disciples ask? Jesus says he's going to be doing these things. So how are they asking for things once Jesus has gone away? They're asking Jesus to do things after he's gone away. What is that? That's through prayer, right? How do you talk to Jesus once he's gone away? You talk to him through prayer. Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So Jesus is saying that he is the one who will answer the prayers of the disciples. Is this someone who's denying his deity? He's already claiming titles that are for Allah, according to the Quran. Here he's claiming uh, that he will answer your prayers, and he's already claimed that he has the same nature and attributes as the Father. Is this someone who is denying his his, his deity? I don't think so. Uh, we go to verse 15, and now we have the Holy Spirit. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Notice, you've got an entire passage that can only be understood in the light of the doctrine of the Trinity. This is where most Muslims go right to the middle of this. And they say, aha, this is talking about Muhammad, this comforter. Right? We get down to verse 25, because this is the, this is the immediate context of the claim that the Father is greater than I. Right? Jesus says in verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, notice the Helper, the Comforter, is identified as the Holy Spirit in the same chapter that Muslims say is referring to Muhammad. They're claiming that Muhammad is the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. What is Jesus doing in this entire passage? Well, the, 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 the entire pa Again, go back to verse 1. The disciples are upset that he's being taken away from them. The disciples are upset because he says he's going up to Jerusalem to die. The disciples are upset that he's going away because they didn't think that's what the Messiah was going to do. They thought they were signing up for someone who's going to conquer the Romans and establish Jewish rule. And he tells them, guys, what you thought was going to happen is not going to happen. Actually, I'm leaving you. Now, that would be absolutely heartbreaking. You've signed on to believe in someone as the Messiah. And he says, I'm about to say bye-bye. Their hearts are broken. And he spends this chapter telling them, don't be upset. It's about to get better. It's going to get better, guys. How is it going to get better? Well, again... Verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Don't be scared, guys. It's about to get better. Verse 28, this is the one Muslims like to quote. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced. 
He says he's going away. He says, and your guys are all upset because I tell you I'm going away. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced. Why would they rejoice over Jesus leaving them? Why would that be a point for them to rejoice? Well, if you look at the context, the context of the Gospel of John, the context of Jesus' words, what he has said is that he entered creation, he lowered himself, right? When the Word became flesh, that was God condescending, taking on a human nature, right? Taking on a human nature to go and do something very important for our salvation. But nevertheless, this is the eternal Son taking on a human nature, living as a baby, living as a man, ultimately getting beaten and killed. That is a massive condescension, right? So when he says, hey, I'm going back, I'm going back to my glory, he's saying, if you loved me, you would be thrilled. If you loved me, you would be happy that I'm going back to have my glory restored, the glory that I laid aside to enter creation and do all these things and to live among you. You would be happy that I'm going back, right? So let's read verse 28. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. So notice, Muslims take that little clip there. The Father is greater than I. What's the actual context? What's the meaning in context? The meaning in context is, guys, so I start off here. I am Lord, right? I'm Lord. I have glory with the Father from all eternity. I lower myself to enter into creation. And once I'm completing my work, I tell you I'm leaving. I'm going back. I'm going back to where I belong. And you guys are saying you're upset, right? Where is Jesus when he's saying this? He's down here, right, in creation. And he's saying, hey, I said I'm going back to the Father. You should rejoice because the Father, if I tell you I'm going to the Father, the Father is greater than I. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that Jesus doesn't share the same nature and attributes as the Father? No, it can't mean that because Jesus has constantly affirmed that he shares the same nature and attributes as the Father. So what does it mean to say that the Father is greater? Well, since Jesus has lowered himself, taken on the nature of a servant, remember he says he has come not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Since Jesus is in that role, incarnate, in the flesh, he has lowered himself, and so when he says the Father is greater than I, this is he says that post post incarnation. He's become incarnate. And he's saying, Of course of course the Father is greater than, than this guy walking around. Of course he is. All right? So it think about this. If if I were to say um the President of the United States is greater than I, what am I talking about? Am I talking about in nature? Like by our, by nature, the president of the United States is greater than I. No, I'd be talking about his 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 his, his present authority, right? Um, you could be talking about all kinds of things. You could talk about you know, if you're talking about Donald Trump, you could say like financially or something. Like that. There are all kinds of different ways that he could be greater than I am. But if I said the president of the United States is greater than I, I would not mean that he is greater than I in terms of my nature, my fundamental nature. I'm a human being. He's a human being. So in terms of our our nature, our our, our attributes, there's. He's not greater than I am at all. He's greater than I am in certain ways. Um, in terms of his present role, his power, his authority, and so on, um, his status as president of the United States, in that sense, he is greater than I, but not in terms of, of our nature or attributes. So when Jesus says the Father is greater than I, the Muslims immediately want to say, oh, this is talking about his nature and attributes. That wouldn't make sense, given anything Jesus said, just said in the, in the rest of the Gospel of John, especially in the Gospel of John chapter 14. It doesn't make sense. Or in John chapter 5, or in John chapter 10. Read the Gospel of John. Instead of just nitpicking these little verses, actually look at what Jesus said. So when Jesus says, the Father is greater than I, is he talking about, hey, given my role and my status right now, the Father is greater than I, or is he saying the Father is greater than I am in nature and attributes? He can't mean that the Father is greater in nature, essence, attributes, things like that, because he has repeatedly affirmed that he and the Father are equal in their nature and attributes. Right. This is why I could say anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So when you read it in that context, the only thing Jesus can mean is in the sense that I have lowered myself to enter creation, since I have laid aside my glory to enter creation. When I tell you guys I'm leaving, I'm going back to the Father, 
You shouldn't be upset. You shouldn't be crying. You should be thrilled because now I'm going back to receive the glory I had with the Father from before the creation of the world. And since I'm going back there, that's the place from where I can answer your prayers. We just read it. Did he, is, he, or, is that what he's saying or is that not what he's saying? So how can a Muslim look at this and say, oh, Jesus said, my father is greater than me. John's gospel, case closed. It is a very Islamic verse. Does this sound like an Islamic verse? Does John chapter 14, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. Jesus answered prayers. Jesus shares the essence and nature and attributes of the father. Jesus and the father together are sending the Holy Spirit who is also God, who has the, the nature and attributes of God. Is this a very Islamic passage, ladies and gentlemen? Or is this yet another example of Muslims completely massacring the meaning of Jesus' words? Why do they do this? And just to confirm, just to confirm that Jesus does mean what I just said, if we go to John chapter 17, where he's concluding, this is all, this is all one long passage, uh, 14, 15, 16, 17. But you get to chapter 17, and Jesus, giving his, his what's called the high priestly prayer, says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Notice, he does not say, Give me some new glory because of the things that I've been doing here, because I'm such a great creation, because I'm such, I've done such great things here. He says, I want back the glory that I had before the creation of the world. So this means what, what Jesus is being restored to his status that he laid aside in order to enter creation. Is this an Islamic verse? Is this an Islamic passage? Of course it's not. And this is why we say, guys, context matters. You got you to gotta look at these passages. And Muslims... Here's what's sad. The Muslims who, who read this, you can see next week, if we bring up the same topic, the same exact Muslims will say, oh, Jesus, Jesus said the Father's greater than I, case closed. And these same Muslims who bring this up, they will, they will go to their friends. And by the way, I don't know if Jawad White is, is, is even a Muslim. Uh, he says it's an Islamic verse, so I'm assuming that, that he's a Muslim. Um, but uh, these same Muslims will go around saying, oh, nope. Jesus said the, the Father's greater than I. I've seen this over and over again, where you can complete, you can show, you can spell out the context for someone. You can say, look, there is no way you can give this an Islamic interpretation. There is no way. Yes, if you ripped part of that verse out of the rest of everything Jesus said, you could say, oh, he says the Father's greater, and give that an Islamic interpretation. But if you look at what he said in the actual passage, that is a million miles away from Islam. That has nothing in common with Islam, this passage. And yet Muslims will go to this passage and say that it affirms Islam. And wow, you see, you see Christians, this affirms Islam. And again, these same Muslims will go to their Christian friends and try to say, use the same argument, which now they know that in context, it can't mean what they're claiming that means. And they'll say it anyway. Why does this religion do this? All right, Anthony, did you want to add anything to that or did you want to move on? Yeah, yeah, quickly. Um, You've already given a full explanation, sufficient explanation of Christ's remark in John fourteen twenty eight, mm -hmm. and then you you pointed out that this is uh, part of a larger section in John's Gospel, mm -hmm. uh, starting in chapter thirteen, going all the way up through chapter seventeen, and you showed how uh, the interpretation you gave of Christ's remark in fourteen agrees with what Jesus says at the at, towards the end of this this larger section. What's interesting is how this whole section begins. Uh, I love this particular text, and I think this is another example of, uh, of a text that people can read and sort of easily miss uh, the, the depth of what's being spoken here. But this is, this is the start of what's called the Upper Room Discourse, which, as you already pointed out, begins in 13, goes all the way up through chapter 17. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 13, it says, Now before the Feast of the Passover... Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, so he knows that his crucifixion is upon him. It says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During the supper, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, now note these words carefully, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God, and was going back to God, got up from supper, and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. 
Now, as you know, this is this is the setup for Jesus, uh, who's about to wash the disciples' feet, showing that he has become a servant for their sake, right? He has humbled himself to the point of washing their feet like a, a common servant would do. Mm-hmm. But what's significant is the context within which Jesus does this. Notice uh, John's remarks. He says, this is, this is what's going on, if you will, in Jesus' mind as he does this. It says, Jesus, this is verse 3, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and and girded himself with it. In other words, Jesus is now illustrating for the disciples the very thing that he had done for them by becoming incarnate so that he might uh, ultimately uh, uh, suffer and die. Right, And this this sounds a lot like Philippians 2, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Pa- Paul says that although existing in the form of God, did not consider the equality that he had with God something to be used to his own advantage, but humbled himself, taking the form of a servant and coming in human likeness, and then and then he says, uh, and even submitting to the death of the cross. So so in effect, you have Jesus now. He's, he's basically giving them a, a living picture of what he had done for them. He lays aside his outer garments and... And then takes upon himself a towel mm-hmm. as he's about to, to serve them and wash their feet. Now, but now notice that's not just uh, a fancy interpretation on my part. Look what Jesus says in, in verse 12 after he washes the disciples' feet. It says, So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, if you will, he's, he's entered, you know, he's, he, he took off his outer garments and he put on a towel and he washes their feet. Now he's put, uh, taken off the towel again and put back on the original garments. And he's at the table again with them, right, mm-hmm. eating with them. And it says, do you know what I have done uh, to you? Uh, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. Mm-hmm. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Now, again, this, this brings up Philippians 2, because the very reason that Paul brings up the, the fact that Christ existed in the form of God and took the form of a servant is because he's telling the Philippians to quit trying to be superior to one another, right? He's saying the same mind should be in you that was in Christ, mm-hmm. who although he was equal to the Father, he submitted himself to the Father for the sake of bringing glory to the Father and salvation to sinners. And he's saying, so likewise, you know, how can you guys, you're just a bunch of men, right? How can you guys sit there and, and be striving to be better than each other in, in, in some ungodly, arrogant way, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly we should be striving to to do good works and that sort of thing. But uh, Paul's saying you shouldn't be uh, arrogant and boastful and proud. Uh, you should con- esteem others as greater than yourself. Now, he's not saying you should think that somebody else has a nature that's fundamentally greater than yours or superior to yours. Uh, he's saying that you guys being equal should esteem others, treat others, react towards others in a way uh, that, that gives deference to them, right? You, you're you're uh, uh, humbling yourself for their sake. And so, I mean, all this fits beautifully together. The, the same theology you find in John, uh, you find in Paul. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 again this just this is just to underscore the interpretation that you showed was already mm-hmm. clear from chapter 14 but it's it's sandwiched in between this this picture that Jesus gives in in chapter 13 and the explicit statement that Jesus makes in mm-hmm. chapter 17 mm-hmm. right yeah and uh, yeah I, I would uh, that, that's actually one of my one of my favorite uh, passages um, in scripture John chapter 13 there where Jesus puts on a kind of play to explain yeah. Christian theology to them. So guys, uh, read John chapter 13, notice, and, and then read, read, uh, a, after you finish reading what Jesus did in John chapter 13, then read John chapter 14 through 17, because as Anthony pointed out, he's giving this illustration. He starts off, he takes off his robe, right? He takes off his robe. So this is, you would think this is degrading, right? This is the guy they believe is the Messiah, right? What's he doing disrobing in front of him? And then he says, I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter's like, you're not washing my feet. What are you talking about? That's like the work of a, of a, of a slave or something like this, a servant, right? It's the, the lowest of the low who would go around washing our feet. And Jesus, nope, I, I, I have to wash your feet. Washes his feet and then puts his clothes back on, sits down. 
And so notice, uh, again, at that in light of what he then goes on to say about how he had eternal glory with the Father. He lays it aside to enter into creation to be a ransom, to be a ransom. In other words, to cleanse his followers. Uh, and then he goes back to to get his glory again. Awesome, awesome, awesome passage. Um, uh, Anthony, I want, we've been talking about uh, reading reading things in context and so on. Uh, here's a quick comment. It's not really on the deity of Christ, but it, it 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 does reinforce what we've been saying about being able to read a passage in context. Here we have from Kazi Samad. <laughs> Great argument here. He says, Jesus talked about Muhammad. So this is evidence that Jesus talked about Muhammad. And I wonder which, which Muslim apologist he got this from, because I'd like to find out, because this is hilarious. It says, Jesus talked about Muhammad. Matthew 3, verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come... Are, Anthony, are you laughing for the same reason I'm laughing? But yeah. after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you. So, Anthony, I mean, one, uh, so notice Muhammad is is the one who comes along and, and baptizes us. Uh, but two, notice, so Anthony, you have Jesus speaking here, according to Kazi. Uh, Jesus is speaking, and Jesus says, I baptize you with water, but after me will come one who's more powerful than I am, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. So according to our Muslim friend here, Jesus is saying that he baptizes, but someone greater is coming who's going to baptize, and Jesus isn't even fit to carry this other person's sandals. Who could this possibly be but Muhammad? Anthony, how many problems are there with this claim? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, this this is another example, I think, of, of what you brought up when we were talking about the deification of Muhammad, right? Yeah. Uh, there was a text that a Muslim cited from Isaiah, Isaiah 42, right? And uh, the text is about Yahweh, but he was saying it's a prophecy of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to hide from Muslims the fact that the text is talking about Yahweh. So if you if you if you take that claim seriously, this it, it's tantamount to saying that Muhammad is God. Well, by the same token, right? If if this is if this is being said by Jesus about Muhammad, then it, the implication would be not simply that Muhammad's a prophet, uh, not even the last and greatest prophet. The implication would be that Muhammad is God, right? Throughout the Old Testament, the prophetic word is the promise. This is uh, the expectation. Okay, remember. Let me put a little bit of this in context. Under the Old Covenant, God uh, has required certain things from his people, but his people repeatedly show that they're not able to meet the terms of the covenant, right? They, they constantly fail, but God holds out the promise to the people that in the future he's going to do something that makes it possible for them now to, to love his law, to keep his law, and so forth. Namely, He's going to pour out his spirit upon them. He's going to give them new hearts. He's going to write his law upon their hearts. Okay, This is what God is going to do. You find the promise in Jeremiah 31. You find it in Ezekiel 36. You find it in Zechariah 12.10, in Joel 2. Numerous places God says he's going to bestow his spirit upon his people so that they might now do the works that God has called his people to do. And... Uh, so uh, when John the Baptist comes in, it, okay, I gave, I let the cat out of the bag. When, when uh, the person who's speaking here, of course, is John the Baptist. I'm sure that's not a surprise to any of the Christians uh, mm -hmm. listening. But John the Baptist is the one who says, "I'm baptizing you with water for repentance," and, and he's showing, by the way, the uh, uh, he, he, that, that baptism, water baptism, uh, is not the same as it's a sign right it's it's mm -hmm. not the the reality it points to something but it's not the thing itself and uh he's saying that what i'm doing then is comparatively insignificant uh given what the messiah is going to do he's talking about jesus jesus is the one who's coming after john who's mightier than john whose sandals john is not fit to carry or remove jesus is the one who's going to baptize with the holy spirit and fire. And uh, so the implication in Scripture is that Jesus is God. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. you said at the beginning, and I, I uh, that this, you know, isn't really on topic, and in a sense, it isn't, but it gets us there too, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Because it, it does prove that Jesus is God 
who in the Old Testament said that he was going to pour out his spirit. Uh, and this is exactly what we read Jesus doing in Acts chapter 2, right? Mm-hmm. It says that, and, and in fact, this ties in with John 14. Jesus says, it's better for you that mm-hmm. I go away. I'm going to ascend to my Father, back to where I was before, and this is going to be a, a benefit to you. And, and part of the reason for that is because now, having accomplished redemption, having performed the work that the Father gave him to do, Jesus, now returning to heaven, receives the gift of the Holy Spirit for the benefit of his people. And it says that Jesus now pours out the Spirit upon the church, right? Uh, And that's because Jesus has now uh, taken away sin. I mean, he's done all those things that are necessary to bestow the Spirit. And so, uh, yeah, this this is incredible for a number of reasons. Number one, it, it, it implies the deity of Muhammad. Number two, it shows no regard for context because it's not Jesus speaking. Number three, it's actually about Jesus, and uh, it shows the deity of Jesus. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, so anyway, Kazi, if you're going around using this, as you most likely are, because you're pasting it here. If you're going around pasting Matthew 3.11 and saying, this is Jesus talking about Muhammad, you might want to read a few verses earlier. This is John the Baptist talking about Jesus. Right? It's John the Baptist talking about Jesus. And Jesus, when he's talking about John the Baptist, said, among those born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. Right? Now think about that. Because John and, John the Baptist here is saying, wait a minute, he's not even fit to carry Jesus' shoes. Not even fit to carry his shoes. Yeah, and by the way, notice verse 12. I mean, even if you ignore the Old Testament background, mm-hmm. he, John says his winnowing, winnowing fork is in his hand. So this is a, a person who's already in existence. Mm-hmm. But he goes on to say he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor <clears throat> He'll gather his wheat into the barn, that speaks of those who are saved, Mm -hmm. but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So here, this one is is said to be the one who will ultimately uh, destroy people in hell. Uh I mean, if that's Muhammad, uh, then we've got another reason to think Muslims deify Muhammad. So, yeah, a couple things here. Uh, One, we, we keep pointing out that Muslims always tend to accidentally deify Muhammad, not realizing that they're uh, making an idol uh, and making a deity out of Muhammad. Uh, that's what Kazi did here. Um, two, this shows the problem of their interpretation, right? That, like they can't, even, they can't even read a verse. They can't even read an entire passage, right? It's like they'll zero in on some verse that they heard from some Muslim apologist because that Muslim apologist didn't bother to read the entire passage either. And they'll go around and start making claims. No concern for truth or accuracy. No concern with actually representing the words of Jesus or John the Baptist accurately, a, a constant desire to misinform. Um, you, you wonder how, how do, how do you Muslims claim to respect the words of the prophets when you destroy them like this? Right? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but third, when you read what the passage is actually saying, this is John the Baptist talking about Jesus and Jesus is clearly divine. If John the Baptist, right? The, the the greatest of people who have just a normal birth says he's not fit to carry the sandals of Jesus. And then in the very next verse, talks about Jesus being the final judge of all mankind. Anthony, according to Islam, who's the final judge of all mankind? Allah. Allah is the final judge. But John the Baptist says it's Jesus. So who would that, who would that, if you're Muslims and you believe that Allah is God, who does that make Jesus here? In this passage that our Muslim friends brought up, that would make Jesus Allah. Allah. So thank you, Kazi, for proving that Jesus is your God and the God of Muhammad. All right, Anthony, we got about uh, 20 minutes before wrapping up. We're actually going long tonight. Um, what do you want to cover from the New Testament? And just so, just so everyone knows, this is not a, this is not a complete case. There's tons of stuff to go through uh, here. But we're going to spend uh, several live streams in the, ne- in the coming weeks dealing with the deity of Christ, and we're going to go through video clips of Muslim apologists like uh, Ahmed Didat and Zakir Naik. We're going to go through uh, their claims about uh, the deity of Christ, their refutations of the deity of Christ. Uh, You'll see them being brought up by Muslims here as well, because Muslims have been influenced by these guys. So we're going to go to the original clips and show that the Muslim apologists that Muslims take as serious serious apologists 
are basically deceivers. And so we're going to go through those clips. We wanted to do this as kind of an introduction. But uh, all right, Anthony, where'd you want to go now? Yeah, well, originally I thought uh, of looking at John 8 uh, at some length, but uh, with only 20 minutes, I don't think we should do that. But uh, maybe on the next show. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, maybe maybe just looking uh, at some of the evidence in in Mark's gospel and and. Uh, you, you know why it's significant to see the deity of Christ in Mark, according to yeah. many scholars, whether whether they're right or not. The, the fact is that many scholars believe Mark's gospel was the first one written. And because of that, you'll have certain scholars say uh, that the New Testament presents a kind of evolving Christology where Jesus is being upgraded. By the way, you know, I used to say this is when uh, I don't know if you used to go to, to Wendy's back in the day. Uh, where I used to work at a Wendy's when I was a kid. This is like over 20 years ago. And uh, whenever you wanted a large fry, you'd say you wanted a biggie fry. That's, mm -hmm. that's what they called it there. Yeah, I remember well, that. Well, apparently, apparently they don't do that anymore. <laughs> I went yeah. to a Wendy's the other day for the first time, and I was like, I want a biggie fry. <laughs> and he's like, what? <laughs> I guess I guess <laughs> I look like a goofball. <laughs> well, you've got, a, you've got a cool laugh, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, so... <laughs> So anyways, they think that John is like supersizing Jesus, yeah. right, com compared mm -hmm. to, to Mark. And so often uh, what you'll get is this claim that Mark doesn't teach Christ's deity, John's gospel does, and so uh, John's gospel is the least reliable, Mark's gospel is the most reliable. Uh, but, you know, there's nothing really in principle that you can't find in Mark uh, that's all you know that you find in John. Uh, you have Jesus being referred to by divine names. Uh, divine attributes are ascribed to him. Divine works are performed by him. Uh, divine honors are received by him or, or are said to be due to him. Uh, and so, uh, uh, yeah, maybe just looking at Mark would, would be somewhat uh, good for the next 10, 13 minutes. But uh, first, then just look at Mark uh, 1. Mm -hmm. uh, we've already. Uh, mentioned this, but uh, in Mark 1, notice how it begins. He says, in the beginning, or excuse me, I'm, I'm quoting John, <laughs> the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is significant that Mark begins uh, by referencing the beginning as well, but there's a little bit of a different uh, emphasis being made here. But John starts off saying, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the the prophets, or uh, uh, there's a textual variant here that I won't get into, but uh, uh, in any case, the uh, what what Mark does here is he he gives us what's called a composite citation, which was common in Judaism, and so uh, uh, usually when you have a composite citation, which means you've you've taken one verse from one place and another verse from another place about the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, and you and you roll them together, if you will. Uh, you usually attribute it to the the main prophet or the the uh, uh, the major prophet. In this case, Isaiah. So uh, here, in effect, what Mark is doing is he's he's quoting both Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3:1. Now I've already cited Malachi 3:1, right, where where it says that the the Lord whom you seek is going to come to his temple. That's the one whose way is being prepared. Uh, but the other passage is Isaiah 40, right? Uh, let me pull up Isaiah 40. According to, well, let me read the passages that occurs in Mark. In Mark, it says, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. That's an allusion to Mark or Malachi 3. Then it quotes Isaiah 40. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Now, David, you, you can answer this for everyone. Uh, who is... Isaiah referring to as Lord in the passage that Mark is citing. Well, that would be Yahweh. That'd be Yahweh. So uh, who is Mark applying this to in, in uh, Mark 1? He's applying it to Jesus, who's... right? Yeah, yeah, yeah he's applying it to Jesus. So uh, when, you, when you look at Isaiah, the full text says, A voice of one crying in the wilderness, uh, you know, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the, the desert a highway for our God. Right, but so it uses two divine titles, Yahweh and Elohim, and this is the one who's coming. This is the one that the voice is preparing the way for. And so, as you read, in fact, just look at verse four: John the Baptist appeared, 
in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And then it goes on speaking of him. Oh, by the way, let me keep reading because it, it, it brings up uh, the same text yeah. that we just read in Mark 3. It says, All the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was uh, locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me, one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Is that about Muhammad? (laughs) <laughs> no, the next verse is going to tell us who it's about. Okay. Verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him and a voice out of the heavens saying, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Uh, by, by, the, you. by the way, I love, I love that passage where the voice comes out of heaven. The voice comes out of heaven. You are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. So this is the father referring to someone as the son. How do they know that the voice is talking about Jesus and not about John the Baptist or about someone else standing there? Well, the Holy Spirit descends to Hmm. identify who, who this is talking about. So you've got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father and Holy Spirit together identifying Jesus as the beloved son. And as, I mean, notice that that's the very, all of that that you just pointed out. Um, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, that's the first verse. Then the next couple of verses, um, Mark takes a passage that is about a messenger preparing the way for Yahweh. And he applies this to John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus, who is therefore Yahweh, and then um, you have John talking about uh, himself being, he's not even fit to um, untie Jesus' shoes because Jesus is so much greater than he is. Um, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Who is this man who baptizes with the Holy Spirit? And then you've got the baptism of Jesus where the (laughs) Father and the Holy Spirit together identify Jesus as the beloved son. You have all of this in the very beginning of our earliest gospel. So you have the deity of Christ repeatedly, and you have the Trinity present. Yeah, and notice how Mark, uh, and you've implicitly said this, but just to make this part more explicit, notice how Mark explicates what it means to call him the son of God. It's not something less than a claim to being absolute deity, right? He he says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. In other words, what Isaiah said is means, I mean, this is the explanation of what it means to refer to him as the Christ, the Son of God, right? He is Yahweh, he is God, who has come now to affect uh, what, it, what scholars call the new exodus. Now, uh, Muslims, I mean, this is uh, one of the things that often sort of disturbs me uh, about the whole interaction with Muslims is that they, they, they're missing an, an incredibly significant portion of the background that's really necessary to understand these things, and they, and they don't realize it, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, remember Jesus throughout the Gospels repeatedly says things like, if you don't believe Moses and the prophets, you know, you're not going to believe me. Right. Uh, He he says, uh, if you believe Moses, you'd believe me because Moses wrote about me. He says that in John five. He tells the uh, in Luke 16, the man who dies and goes to hell. Remember, he's talking to uh, uh, Abraham and Lazarus, whom he sees afar off in in bliss. And he's down there suffering. And he says, let me go back to my brothers and warn them. And Jesus says, no, he goes, they they have Moses and the prophets. If they don't believe them, they're not going to believe even if you go back to them from the dead. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so. But, but the idea is that the Old Testament has been pre- preparing people for uh, the things that Jesus is going to say and do. They've been preparing people to recognize him when he comes. And this is part of why it's so silly for Muslims to say things like, where did Jesus say, I am God? They don't realize there's 39 books preceding Jesus' coming that, that you know, when he comes uh, and he says certain things, 
it's almost like it's it's more significant that he mm-hmm. says it the way that he does than that it would be less significant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, people who have no previous scripture may need God come to say to them things like "I am God, worship me," right? Because they're part of an uh, ignorant uh, group of people, scripturally speaking. Uh, they they have no prior knowledge, so uh, it's one thing to say that uh, Allah had to speak very clearly to Muhammad. Not that Allah really did speak very clearly. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't seem to speak very clearly most of the time. But anyways, the, the point is that the Jews have this rich theological, textual tradition behind uh, all of this, that when Jesus comes, I mean, the deity of Christ is really just jumping out at, uh, at, at us, right? I mean, we're mm-hmm. looking at Mark 1, and we're just seeing think one significant thing after another because we're familiar with the Old Testament background. Well, here's something that, that many people... Uh, might miss that that's really significant is in fact it's 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 important to the entirety of mark's gospel uh one of the issues that comes up later in mark is when when jesus asked peter who do you say that i am and, and peter says you are the christ then jesus tells peter yeah i'm going now i'm going to the cross right i'm going to be i'm going to suffer and die and peter says no way mm-hmm. and that you know you're the christ you you can't go to the cross now, what's interesting is in Mark's account, he doesn't give the full uh, account. He just gives us the part of it that's relevant to what, what he's talking about. But most of us have memorized it as it occurs in Matthew's Gospel. In Matthew's Gospel, he gives us a fuller account. Matthew In Matthew, Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you still have the same discussion following after mm-hmm. that, where, where Peter objects, no, you can't go to the cross, far be it from you, Lord, right? I mean, you're the Messiah, you can't. You can't suffer and die. That just doesn't make any sense. Well, uh, so it, it's interesting, though, that uh, now I've, I've said that Mark doesn't include that part, and I think Mark is doing it for a very important reason. In Peter's mind, the fact that Jesus is the Son of God precludes the fact that he's going to the cross, right? And so Mark kind of highlights that, if you will. He, uh, Peter doesn't really get how those two things go together, and so when Mark records it, he just he just gives us the uh, the first part of it. You're the Christ. And the reason that's interesting is because when you look at the entirety then of Mark's gospel, you never see any human being use that phrase. Again, this is a literary point. I'm not saying that Peter didn't make the full expression that, that M- Matthew gives us. I'm just saying that literarily, because Peter doesn't think those two things go together, the death of Christ, the sonship of Christ, Mark has skillfully left it out because he's going to highlight something. Uh, and, and so, just, just follow this out for a second. When you look at the, the Gospel of Mark, no human being in the entirety of Mark's Gospel confesses his sonship until you get to the very end. Right? However, what you do find, you find the Father confessing that Jesus is the Son. You, you have it here at the baptism, 1, 9 through 11. You have the demons confessing that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, just later in, in Mark 1, the, the, remember the demons cry out, we know who you are, right? The Holy One mm-hmm. of God or the Son of God. Same thing in Mark 3, same thing in Mark 5. Over and over again, the demons see Jesus, they run up to him, they throw themselves down at his feet, and they say, what do you want with us? Are you here to destroy us, right? They know who he is. So the Father knows who Jesus is, the demons know who Jesus is, Jesus testifies to his own sonship, uh, but no human being... Uh, has has expressed it. It's not until you get to the cross where Jesus suffers and dies that finally the centurion says, "Truly, this was the Son of God." Now, now that you should that should appear to people as incredibly ironic, because you know in the earlier part of Mark's gospel, Jesus is performing miracles. Mm-hmm. He's stilling the winds and the waves. Right in Mark four, he 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 stills the winds and the waves. In Mark six, he walks on the water and uh, the the storm stops and the the boat's on the other side of the, of the sea suddenly. Uh, he, he multiplies bread, uh, and he f- feeds uh, 4,000 and 5,000 people two different occasions. Uh, he heals people over and over again. None of that leads anybody to the right conclusion. Right? What, what does lead somebody to conclude that Jesus is the Son of God is Jesus dying on the cross. <laughs> that mm-hmm. just seems like it's the opposite of what, what it should be, right? It's certainly the opposite of Islamic reasoning. Muslims conclude from the fact that if Jesus died on the cross, he can't be the Son of God. But now here's why this is all so brilliant. Notice how Mark begins the Gospel when when identifying Jesus as the Son of God. He doesn't just call Jesus the Son of God. He calls him, uh, it says, "You." uh, the Father speaking from heaven says, You are uh, my beloved Son, 
in you I'm well pleased. My beloved son. Now, what most people don't know is the term here is agapitos in Greek. And uh, there's another term that's very similar to it uh, in Greek called it's monogenes. And it's the term that John uses, right? When John refers to Jesus as God's unique son or his only begotten, it's the term monogenes. Right, the, the term he uses in John one fourteen, John three sixteen, and elsewhere. Well, these two terms are almost synonymous in Greek, and they're used in the Old Testament to translate uh, one Hebrew word. Uh, so, in some cases, this Hebrew word, which is yachid, is translated with agapitos, beloved, or monogenes, only begotten. Okay. Now, what's now? Here's why this is so significant. That term's used about twelve times in the Old Testament. Okay, yachid, which again, Greek in Greek, when it's translated, it's either agapitos or monogenes, a beloved son or only begotten son. Every single time that word is used in the Old Testament, it always refers to the only son of a father who either has died or is about to die and whose death uh, is, is now a cause for mourning, right? Now, everybody will recognize the first passage where this word occurs in the Old Testament, and you'll recognize why it's significant. The first occurrence is in Genesis 22, right? In Genesis 22, God says to Father Abraham, take your son, your only son, mm -hmm. and offer him as a, a sacrifice on Mount Moriah, right? So the first time this term is used, it's uh, where Abraham is told to take his only son, his agapetos, huios, his beloved son, and offer him as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Now, we know why that's significant, because it's a foreshadowing of the crucifixion, right? Mm -hmm. Where God, God the Father takes his only begotten son, his beloved son, and offers him as a sacrifice. Mount Moriah, where Abraham was to take Isaac, was the place where Jerusalem was later situated, uh, right? Well, the last recorded incident is found in Zechariah 12.10. In Zechariah 12.10, God says, They'll look mm -hmm. upon me, me whom they have pierced, Mm -hmm. And they'll mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, a beloved son, a only begotten son, right? Mm -hmm. And so the first and last instance of this refers, it's either a type of Christ or an explicit prediction. And the same can be said of some of the other instances. But it, again, uniformly throughout the Old Testament, this refers to a unique son who's going to suffer and die. And so, right at the very beginning, God the Father is already telling everybody who knows the Old Testament, this is the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sin of the world. Mm -hmm. This is my beloved Son. And so, ironically, the cross is not the disproof of Christ's deity, it's the very proof of it. This is what God said would happen. His Son would come into the world and die for sinners. That's why the centurion at the cross says, surely this was the Son of God, because... Uh, and again, I just just one one quick uh, uh, one other observation. Remember at the uh, at the crucifixion, uh, it says that the sun went dark at midday and it, it stayed dark until uh, the uh, for three hours. This was actually prophesied in Amos. It says in in Amos eight nine, it will come about in that day, declares the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. Now, but now listen to this the following verse. Then I will turn your festivals into mourning. Remember, Jesus being crucified during the festival of Passover. And all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on everyone's loins and baldness on every head. And I will make it like a time of mourning for an only son. And the end of it will be like a bitter day. And so here's the centurion. The sun has gone dark as Jesus is being crucified. And... Uh, you have to follow the narrative closely here. It says that the sun went dark at noon, uh, and it stayed dark for three hours, basically until the time when Jesus cries out, the veil of the temple is torn, right, and Jesus gives up his spirit. So in other words, when Jesus cries out that final time, it's like the lights of the heavens go back on. And so mm -hmm. here's the centurion. Jesus is on the cross, and heavens the heavens go dark, and then Jesus, three hours later, lets out a loud cry, the lights go back on, the veil of the temple is torn, and he's standing there looking at this, and he's, he's like, surely th this must have been God's son. You know, what, what, what else, what other explanation can be given? Mm -hmm. so, anyway. All right, well, uh, we are, with that, we are about out of time. Oh, my goodness.
I'm just looking at some of the uh, comments by Muslims <laughs> over here. <laughs> well, we have our work cut out for if they're still. <laughs> Uh, this one uh, going to to John one twenty one to affirm the uh, to affirm that Jesus prophesied about Muhammad. Wow! Uh, please, please bring that up next time towards the beginning. That's one of, of my a, favorites. Yeah, we love boy, we love that one. We love it when they that's that's almost as good as uh, the passage where where John the Baptist is talking about Jesus and uh, our Muslim friends try to insist that this is actually. Uh, Jesus talking about Muhammad. You have to love, you have to love the level of understanding that centuries of Muslim apologists have given to their Muslim followers. They can't read a verse in context. They can't accurately describe what a verse is saying. They constantly misrepresent who's saying what. Um, can't get basically anything right about a passage. And these are the guys who are claiming claiming to speak the truth. Um, we have about three, a little over three minutes left. Anthony, I think this question for you is a, a good way to uh, close out the live stream. This is from Wahid Wahid, who says, what is the difference between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam? So what's the difference? Well, we have to, first of all, distinguish uh between uh, Judaisms, right? There, there's really uh, a plurality of what goes under the name of Judaism. If by Judaism you mean the religion of the prophets, the religion taught in the Old Testament, there's no fundamental difference between Judaism and Christianity. They're one and the same. Uh, the only difference, which is, again, it's not, it's not an essential or fundamental difference, the only difference is that uh, the Old Testament is looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, the accomplishment of the work of redemption that God is preparing the world for throughout the Old Testament, and the fulfillment itself. So that's that's the basic difference between Judaism and Christianity, if we're speaking biblically uh, and uh, in terms of what God is doing. However, um, you know, there, there have been uh, different... Uh, interpretations, even at the time of Christ, you know, you had different sects. You had the Sadducees, you had the Pharisees, you had the Essenes, uh, and, and, you know, there, there are differences between these groups. You know, e Muslims would have to say that, you know, they're not in agreement with all these groups, right? The, mm -hmm. the Sadducees didn't believe that man has a soul that exists independently of the body or at the death of the body. They didn't believe that there were spirits or angels. And that's because the Sadducees, by and large, restricted themselves to the, the Torah, which doesn't have, I think it says more than, than many people realize, but it doesn't make as many comments about some of these things as it does about other things. And so if you're restricting yourself to that, then, uh, you know, it, 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 it allows for people to, uh, you know, say, that, say certain things that, that other people aren't going to say. The Pharisees, on the other hand, believed in all of those things. They believed man had a soul. They believed that uh, there would be a resurrection. Remember, Paul, when he's on trial, he actually uses this difference between mm -hmm. the Jews uh, against them, mm -hmm. right? Because he's arguing that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, the Sadducees are opposed to him because, of course, they don't think anybody's going to rise from the dead. Mm -hmm. And so when Paul stands up, he says, I'm on trial today because I believe in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, I, I believe somebody actually rose mm -hmm. already, right? <laughs> All right, so, so if we uh, if we take Judaism as the religion of the prophets to where they're looking forward to the coming of the Lord into creation and the work that he's going to do, and then Christianity looking back to the finished work of Christ and then proclaiming it to the world, what would be the difference between, on the one hand, Judaism and Christianity, and on the other hand, Islam, in a nutshell? Yeah, so uh, the difference between true Judaism, Old Testament Judaism, which is simply uh, Christianity before Christ came into the world and fulfilled what it promised, uh, the difference between that religion and Islam is, of course, we have a very different conception of God, Old Testament believers and New Testament believers have always believed that God is multipersonal. We believe that God is incorporeal. He doesn't have a body. God is spirit. God is infinite as such. So he, he's uh, uh, transcendent. He can't mm -hmm. be confined by anything, but he's also present everywhere in the world. Nothing uh, limits him. Nothing can keep him out. Uh, we, we have all sorts of differences in our conception of God. We also have different views of salvation. Uh, we believe that God has prepared a way to save mankind through 
the, the sacrifice of his son, who uh, sacrificed himself having become incarnate. Uh, Muslims, of course, reject all of that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the differences are, are quite marked, uh, and we could hardly scratch the surface in, in less than a minute. So, mm -hmm. All right, so big differences, and we will be examining these differences further in future live streams. I'm not sure when I'll be back on live. I'll have to find out when Sam Shamoon is free this week. Um, Anthony and I will most likely be returning, uh, Lord willing, next Friday, where we will be looking at some clips of probably Ahmed Didat on the deity of Christ. So I'll see everyone later. God bless you all.